Hello team and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself Jonathan MSP. This is Ukraine War update extra video giving you extra tidbits and nuggets to get your teeth into to give you a greater understanding of the war in Ukraine. Where are we going to go to first? Well we're going to go not to the Nord Stream uh, pipeline but we're going to go to Seymour Hirsch. Uh, just do a little chat about him. Who is he? Well he's a uh, he's a very famous Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist who was famous in you know writing about issues with the Vietnam War uh, and has written some you know very good stuff in in the history of his writing but he seems to have veered off into a very uh, odd direction in the last decade uh, I, I you know I don't want to be ageist or anything but he's he's definitely not thinking as rationally as he could do and he's adopted very much pro-Russia stances with his writing particularly in in terms of what he's written about Syria and chemical attacks um, all sorts of things very kind of anti-US establishment but by uh, by extension pro-Russia and he wrote an article on the Nord Stream attacks that was really really problematic although it sounded like it was really good when you looked into the details with a fine tooth comb they would, they just didn't add up uh, and indeed what happened what has happened since is that the articles and evidence has come out to suggest that his account was just not true at all now it might be that the US were behind the Nord Stream uh, attacks but they weren't behind them in the way that Seymour Hirsch claims in his article. His article is full of uh, you know, claims that derive from single sources where you're that are anonymous, and you're thinking, well, who is that source? It, it sounds really dodgy, uh, and I, I, I don't agree with any of this. And actually, since then, there's been far more data coming out to support that Ukraine were actually behind it, and not the US and Norway. And so you know, whatever your view is now, it seems that Seymour Hersh's account as to what happened with the pipelines getting blown up all the way back last year, his account is just wrong. It's just not correct. I wrote uh, an article back in February this year uh, analysing his claims and then looking at other bits of data and looking at what the most plausible explanation is, who has the best reason to blow up the, the pipeline, so on and so forth. And I came to the conclusion at the end that I don't really know. I, I, I think I slightly err on the side of Russia did it for these reasons, but actually I think that the, the US might have had more reason to do it and so on. Anyway, the point is, uh, you know, I, I was kind of unsure after all that analysis, and it's a long old article I wrote, it's a really big article, I was like, yeah, not really sure. But what I am sure of is that Seymour Hirsch is incorrect. And he, he, here is why he's incorrect. Anyway, so we go on now to his latest article on Substack. It's not a very long one, but it's just really interesting because a lot of the similar issues where he's relying on uh, claims from single sources that aren't really fleshed out in terms of you know who they are and uh, whether they're reliable. He says, let's take a, a look at recent events in the Ukraine war from the point of view of those in the American intelligence community who don't feel that they have the ear of President Joe Biden but should. On July the 17th, Ukraine attacked for a second time one of Russia President Vladimir's proudest achievements. Uh, so it doesn't even call him Putin. It's President Vladimir. It's President Joe. Uh, he calls him President Joe Biden, but this is President Vladimir's proudest achievements. The 11.25 mile Kerch Bridge linking Crimea to Russia. $3.7 billion bridge with separate spans for auto and train traffic was opened to auto traffic in May of 2018 and for trucks five months later with Putin's him Putin himself being the first one to make the crossing. Uh, Ukrainian President uh, Vladimir Zelensky made it clear before the Russian invasion early last year that he considered the bridge a legitimate military target, uh, so on and so forth. I'm going to join it a little bit later. And here he says, the Biden administration's role in both attacks was vital. Quote, of course, it was our technology. And quote, one American official told me. So this is these are the words of an American official. The drone was remotely guided and half submerged like a torpedo, end quote. I asked if there was any thought before the bridge attack about the possibility of retaliation. Quote, what will Putin do? We don't think that far, quote, the official said. Uh, quote, our national strategy is that Zelensky can do whatever he wants to do. There's no adult supervision. 
Putin responded to the second attack on the bridge by ending an agreement that enabled Ukrainian wheat and other vital food crops stymied by the ongoing war to be shipped from blocked ports on the Black Sea. Quote, um, brackets, before the war, Ukraine exported more grain than the entire European Union and nearly half of the world's sunflower seeds. Uh, and Russia began steadily intensifying missile and rocket attacks in Odessa, whose initial target list has expanded from port areas to inner city sites. The official said there was a lot more than grain and sunflower seeds flowing into Europe from Odessa and other Black Sea ports. Quote, Odessa's exports include illegal stuff like drugs and the oil that Ukraine was getting from Russia. Right. Just a little sidebar here. So, Seymour Hersh has admitted that Russia were hitting sites within Odessa and more and more, you know, port sites and sites within the city limits. And his justification, because, you know, you, you don't admit that without saying, and therefore that's unfair, it's a bit of a war crime. So he then goes to the justification, where, but Odessa does export a load of illegal stuff like drugs and oil that Ukraine was getting from Russia, you know, without any attempt to... Uh, to provide evidence for the claim that this supposed American official is saying. No attempt to, to uh, substantiate that claim. That's really irresponsible uh, journalism here, if you can call it journalism, to, to, to say something like that. And then just, just leave it hanging. Yeah, there you go. Massive claim there. Just going to leave that there. Not going to say anything about it. Uh, he goes on, at this point, with the Ukraine counteroffensive against Russia thwarted, the official said, so again, is it thwarted? Um, quote, Zelensky has no plan except to hang on. It's as if he's an orphan, a poor waif in his underwear, and we have no real idea of what Zelensky and his crowd are thinking. Ukraine is the most corrupt and dumbest government in the world outside of Nigeria, and Biden's support of Zelensky can only come from Zelensky's knowledge of Biden and not just because he was taking care of Biden's son. Right. I'm not going to read any more. In fact, there's not much more to say. In fact, there's just that little bit there. There are some in the Amer American intelligence community, the official said, who worry about Putin's response to the recent Ukrainian drone attacks in central Moscow. Will Kiev be next? OK, will Kiev be next? Right. So this is supposedly an American intelligence official. And this does not read at all like an intelligence, American intelligence official. And we're going to come on to an absolute humdinger in a second. But this kind of rhetoric, we have no real idea of what Zelensky and his crowd are thinking. OK, so Zelensky and his crowd is really pejorative. Then he says, always concentrate on the little things here, the words like uh, someone in the intelligence community would not be that, uh, would not say things like that. I'm absolutely positive. He says, Ukraine is the most corrupt and dumbest government in the world outside of Nigeria. That's not something an American would say. Just the, the You just wouldn't call them the dumbest government in the world. If you're in the intelligence community, that is not an assessment. It's just such a subjective, almost valueless uh, statement. It's just so unlike an intelligence um, operative. Just outside of Nigeria, that's not that's not on the American radar. That necessarily is a kind of comparison, I think. Uh, and Biden's support of Zelensky can only come from Zelensky's knowledge of Biden, not just because he's taking care of Biden's son. Anyway, so that's really problematic. So my my view here is that this isn't an American uh, uh, official here. So if we go back to who this was, an American official told me. Um, what kind of official? Official in what role? I mean, yeah, not are you an are you actually an intelligence official? Don't know. Doesn't say they're actually. So you're just. Uh, I mean, he goes on to say there are some in the American intelligence community. The official said so. The implication would be he's in the intelligence community, but it doesn't really say that. This is really sloppy from Seymour Hirsch. And what absolutely puts a nail in the coffin of this article is this brilliant little find. I wouldn't. I I read this and thought, okay, that's a bit odd, but I don't really know that saying. He said it's is it's as if he's an orphan, a poor waif in his underwear. I've never heard that, so I just read over that and like, whatever. Apparently, that is a Russian uh, term, right? So, OMG, 
Seymour Hersh's handler really messed up. The anonymous US official supposed to be briefing Hersh used a Russian expression. He gives the Russian uh, Cyrillic translation, the actual expression there, that English speakers don't use. I've never heard this in my life. A poor, and I've taught writing, right? I am a writer. Uh, a poor waif in his underwear. It's a, it's a Russian saying. In other words, this in, in other words, Seymour Hersh, this article, just that phrase alone, in my opinion, not only destroys this article, but it destroys uh, Seymour Hersh's, I think, Nord Stream article that that's, that was blaming the US and Norway. Just apps. He his hand. He he has some a contact who is who is a Russian contact. Possibly he thinks genuinely thinks he's an American contact. Uh, but it's pulling and he's just pulling the wool over Hersh's eyes. But this, I think, this is absolutely uh, incredible here because it, it, that single phrase, I think, now uh, invalidates Seymour Hersh from ever being taken seriously again. And that's the end of it. Uh, there you go. Uh, anyway, uh, time to move on. So we will. PS style one here, one says. Uh, it gives a translation. I don't know if they translate it themselves, but uh, a someone interviewed here. Interview. They have a Russian POW talking about Nazism in Moscow. I did a whole piece yesterday on Nazism and and, and the right in uh, in Russia. He he tells about the corruption schemes ongoing in the Russian army, where the commander is able to afford a Range Rover after six months. So this is a really conversational interview he gives. I, I'm not going to read it out because actually the translation isn't. It's not the easiest. It doesn't kind of flow particularly well. But what he does talk about uh, is a number of things here. He is basically slagging off the DPR, the Donetsk People's Republic, the militia that fights, uh, sorry, Donetsk People's Republic, fights on behalf of Russia using Ukrainians from the Donetsk Oblast. You've got the LPR as well. He says the LPR is not as bad. The DPR is worse. Uh, this arguably there's a lot of Russians drawn into them. In fact, he's kind of uh, possibly one of them. You get a lot of mobilized that are, are taken under the wing of the DPR or LPR, and then they are sent to the front lines themselves, uh, while the DPR don't send their own people in because they, they don't want to die. They're, and actually, there's a kind of view amongst some of the DPR that, that and probably LPR, that actually, you know, we don't really want to do this war. This is kind of a Russian thing. Uh, so if, if someone's going to die for for this cause it's going to be a mobilized russian soldier rather than one of ours but he is really interesting what he says in terms of you know the uh, the drinking the drugs and also the not getting injured like it feeds into that idea that they are sent mobilized in and not themselves he's like when you start looking at the wounded now they're all russian soldiers not dpr uh, and so on and so forth it, it is even though you know the reading isn't so doesn't flow so well, but it is you know a bit of an insight into an experience that certainly that a Russian soldier has of uh, the DPR. Now, uh, going to go on to Mers here, who is someone is a Russian source and Russian army. Now that Igor Gherkin is away, uh, there's someone else that's taken over the doom posting, as Dimitri from War Translated says. It's a long post, uh, uh, so the full piece is on the screenshots summary below. I'm going to actually go through the full piece just to uh, uh, give you an idea of what he says. Um, there's just uh, three to go through here. So... In the meantime, our amazing propaganda moved from stories of Ukrainian counteroffensive has been repelled to the stories of they finally crawled through the f forefield uh, to the first line of our defence. So what? I mean, that opening paragraph from a Russian source is basically saying that Russians are, that are just full of propaganda, like the Russian narrative is just propaganda. Um, let me try again to explain what is happening in human language. It is not so important how deep the enemy has advanced, but how much the balance of forces in the direction has changed during his advance. Fortifications, no matter how powerful they may be, including minefields, are of little worth without the necessary filling with fortifications and fire cover of the minefields. Uh, TM Mine will 
not jump out of the ground and run after the leopard shouting, stop, you nasty bee-hatch. I shouldn't have been in the mud for half a year. The enemy piece of iron must itself run into these mines in an attempt to overcome the minefield or bypass it because, because a minefield has eyes and eyes have a radio station and at the other end of the radio channel is, for example, a 152mm artillery battery. And clearing a minefield covered by gunfire by any means is a long and dreary task, which will only result in significant success only when the battery with its guns will be driven away by an immediate counter-battery fire so that the mine-clearing vehicle and a platoon of sappers would be able to come up and work without being stuffed with cast iron, he says. In other words, you know, if the Ukrainians want to clear the minefields, they need to get counter-battery to take out our, our uh, artillery batteries and we need to be uh, covering the minefields with fire and artillery. Instead of artillery battery, there may be mobile tourists, ATGMs. There may be helicopter pilots also with ATGMs. Both variations and combinations are possible. So if you spend all your reserves and resources on the defence of the foreground and do it reasonably because in the foreground you have places that are convenient to defend, exchanging people and equipment at the most favourable rate, then the enemy's access to the main line of defence is very, very bad. Not because you miscalculated the defence of the forefield, but because the enemy crushes you with numerical and qualitative superiority. As I've already said, in order to break through our defences, the enemy is not interested in the depth of his penetration into our defence in itself, but in changing the balance of forces in the sector. If ours grind down faster than the enemy, then instead of an unshakable wall of the main line of defence, he may encounter emptiness or almost emptiness. It is precisely in order to sharply change the balance on that sector of the front where the main prize of the summer campaign that they want lies that the enemy is carrying out attacks in other directions, including, first of all, on the flanks of Bakhmut. And his numerous eyes on our side of the front tell him what and where he is going there to strengthen the, these flanks. Obviously, translation is not perfect. It was in order for the enemy to pull his own reinforcements north that an offensive was launched in the north on the northern flank of the D, of the LPR. If the enemy, so that's up in the Luhansk area, it, where they've made that salient by Karmazinivka. If the enemy forces are underestimated, then this will be a waste of the critically important last combat-ready units that could support the flanks of Bakhmut. It's exactly what I was saying the other day, which is quite a risk. Yes, they may take some land up in that Karmazinivka area, but is that the best use of their troops when they could be supporting the defence of Bakhmut, when they could be supporting the defence defense of Zaporizhia? If the Ukrainians are able to withhold those forces in Luhansk without committing their own counteroffensive forces, then actually that's m possibly not well spent resources in terms of uh, the Russian uh, calculus calculation. The answer to the question, how did it happen that the enemy has such a numerical superiority over us, and in some places also a qualitative one? lies in the winter and spring meat assaults, which gobbled up the lion's share of the people mobilised in the autumn. The enemy, constantly combing their rear for men fit for mobilisation, is successfully replenished, training some while others are being caught, and the rest are dying, paving the way for the Ukrainians to go forward. In other words, what he's saying here is that, effectively, the activities in Bakhmut over autumn and winter did the job of attriting the Russian forces all the while. And this is what I was saying at the time, that while the Ukrainians were defending in Bakhmut, they weren't bringing in the, tr the forces that they were... They were using that they were training that were getting NATO training or they were training back in the in the west of Ukraine, ready for their own counteroffensive. They ring fenced those forces and resources. They didn't send them to Bakhmut. They used existing forces and rotated them quite sensibly. Uh, they they basically seeded Bakhmut at a at a attritional rate that was advantageous to to them. They took out a lot of the Russian soldiers. Russia broadly just about took Bakhmut in 11 months and went, yay, we've taken Bakhmut. But this is an acceptance that that whole strategy was correct. Because it's like they spent that time training troops and recruiting troops and mobilizing troops. They are tritted ours and we're now at, at a position where we don't have that strength in depth. We don't have the reserves and they are able to uh, penetrate in a way that, uh, that spells disaster for 
uh, the Russians. You know, if ours grind down faster than the enemy, then instead of an unshakable wall of the main line of defence, he may encounter emptiness or almost emptiness. And this is exactly what I've been talking about, how how the, the front lines in the Zaporizhia and Donetsk region might well be very thin, thinly manned. And once you do break through, things can gather momentum potentially quite quickly. Anyway, that was uh, Mertz, this chap uh, who's taken over Gherkin's role of doom posting. Just going to go to a couple of comments on my threads. Uh, I, I love my community or the, you know, your community and mine, but you, I love what you guys bring to this. But this I thought was interesting. I uh, And it was in answer to um, kind of... Uh, well, this is directly on the chat I had with Matt Bishop, the Australian who's married to a Ukrainian, and I had a live chat. Go, go and press the live tabs and, and check it out if you haven't already listened to it. Really enjoyed that. I am well, she says, and lived in a village on the outskirts of Kiev. My wife and I left when the Russians were about twenty, were just 20 miles away. We had to leave almost all possessions, just taking what we could throw into the car and drive. At the time, a large part of Kiev was ringed by Russian forces. Uh, the road to Poland was closed. Uh, to the, was close to their line, sorry, and unpassable at the time. Like Matthew, we had to take the long winter drive through central Ukraine to the border with Romania, and that was an adventure. Many commentators stress the difference between Russian and Ukrainian speakers. Myself, I found it a bilingual country with no problems either way. As an example, during our long and interesting drive out, we had to pass through many roadblocks. It was difficult to travel more than 20 miles without being stopped. Some of these blocks were local militia and others official military. In every case, when close to western ukraine we were spoken to in russian first in fact then when stopped by the official military then they realized i was british they were helpful and friendly and asked me to pass on their thanks and gratitude to the british people and boris johnson in particular for support and help i have known ukraine for about 20 years and if anyone has any doubt doubts it was only after they got rid of yanukovych that it started to improve for everyone. Like Matthew, I also found Kiev pre-war a safe city, safer than London, and Ukraine, Ukrainian people to be friendly and genuine. Salt of the earth in the main, honest, well-educated, hardworking, patriotic, and with a belief in their country and a better future for which they are prepared to work and fight. Qualities that I fear are sadly lacking in today's UK. We are hoping to return soon. Uh, really interesting. And this one, uh, very meaningful as well on a different video. My wife is a Ukrainian from Odessa. Lately, she suffers. So thank you. This is from Just Silas. And the previous one was Brian Knapp. So thanks, Brian. I really appreciate your your uh, input there. Uh, Just Silas says, my wife is a Ukrainian from Odessa. Lately, she suffers anxiety terribly and sometimes loses faith, feeling all is lost. Your news updates and extras are like a healing balm to her. As for me, I am a true believer in Ukraine's ability from after Zelensky said, I don't need a ride, I need bullets. From studying history as a minor, I expect ups and downs to happen, but I've never lost hope for Ukraine. And you play a great part in the faith I stand on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who are members of this community, uh, members in, you know, obviously the technical sense, but no, all of you, the larger community here uh, at ATP Geopolitics, I really appreciate that you are following and I'm over 24,000 subscribers. I never would have thought I would have a channel that that basically takes up my entire day of, of you know feeding my obsession, but also feeding your obsessions or giving you information that you desperately need if you're in a position where you do desperately need this information from someone who you deem uh, at least somewhat reliable. And that's what I hope to be, reliable. I... I I don't try and pull the wool over my own eyes. And by extension, I'm not trying to pull the wool over your eyes. That's really important to me. It's important to me philosophically. It's why I, I've always seen my, when I used to write blogs before I was sort of doing journalism, I was writing to put my ideas out there so other people could attack them as a way of then being able to refine them for me so that I have a better understanding of reality. So I put my ideas out there. You can attack them, but I, I'm not lying to you. I, this is what I feel and what I think is true. Um, although I do have my biases, my moral biases, which may affect the sources I look at and confirmation bias may affect the way that I interpret more value from pro-Ukrainian sources than from pro-Russian sources. But I'm aware of that and I do try and mitigate that. So I hope I am and 
doing a serviceable job in uh, in that regard. And and thank you so much to Just Silas for sharing that, and all the best to uh, your wife there. You know, if, goodness me, I can't begin to think of of the anxieties that that people might uh, be feeling having to leave or, or staying within Ukraine and, and dealing with everything um, that uh, this war has has thrown at them, at you. Um, right, moving on. Here is a medivac from the front. I, I'm just showing this because, A, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an M113. Just, these are old APCs, right, but they're being used quite a lot in terms of, yes, transporting troops around in the, in the background, not really being sent onto the front line. But if they do get to the front line, it's often because they are being used as a medivac. And here we have one uh, doing that, scooting around the corner, stopping. I love the way it stops here and then goes, oh, no, I've gone half a meter too far. Right. Ah, oh, that's better. <laughs> Just reversed it a little bit. Makes all the difference. Uh, but yeah, fantastic. And they're, they're, the Ukrainians have been given a bunch of these from many nations, including the YPR 765s from the Dutch, which are upgraded version of these, and then other M113s. I think the Belgian now doing some up and sending them over. They're getting them from Spain, a number of different countries. And uh, yeah, being super useful for just transporting troops really quickly. Question is, you know, is does this uh, symbolize or represent uh, an advantage that the Ukrainians have over the Russians. Are the Ukrainians, when I mean, we hear a lot about this, we know it's not perfect, but my understanding is that they have field hospitals that are close to the front lines and they do a really good job, or at least a better job, of getting their injured troops off the battlefield and to these hospitals uh, and then to maybe the, the major hospitals in a way that the Russians are unable to do or perhaps even unwilling to do. Um, I, and I, th I just think, you know, that that shows a bit of an advantage for the Ukrainians. I'd be interested to see what you guys think. Right, to finish off, I'm going to go to a excerpt that I recorded the other day but didn't have time to, to leave it on the video. It would have made the other day's video about 40 minutes long. No, about 50 minutes long. So I, I, I'm whacking it on the end of this. So here it is for you. Uh, this is Putin. This is a, a, a Washington Post article. The Russian president has been warned by the Russian security services that at least uh, two to three days ahead, of, at least two to three days ahead of time, that Prigozhin was preparing a possible rebellion, according to intelligence assessments. Now, this is pretty interesting. So sometimes you hear of Putin being described as a risk taker. Uh, that, you know, psychologically he's like this or like that. But there are some people, is it Michael Rice that's called him a serial procrastinator. That he doesn't actually do things straight away where at some points he should. And here's one example. So Putin appeared paralyzed and unable to act in his first hours of rebellion. So this article says the Russian president had been warned by the Russian security services at least two to three days ahead of time that Prigozhin was preparing to a possible rebellion, according to intelligence assessment shared with the Washington Post. Steps were taken to boost security at several strategic facilities, including the Kremlin, where staffing in the presidential guard was increased and more weapons were handed out. But otherwise, no actions were taken, these officials said. Putin had time to take the decision to liquidate the rebellion and arrest the organisers, said one of the European security officials who was uh, speaking under anonymity. Then, when it began to happen, there was paralysis on all levels. There was absolute dismay and confusion for a long time. They did not know how to react. Uh, this account of the standoff, corroborated by officials in Western governments, provides a most detailed look at the paralysis and disarray inside the Kremlin during the first hours of the severest challenge to Putin's 23-year presidency. It is consistent with public comments by CIA Director William J. Burns last week that for much of the 36 hours of the mutiny, Russian security services, the military and decision makers appeared to be adrift. So... That is quite incredible that kind of no one knew what was going on, what to do. It was all a bit chaotic. The lack of orders, the article continues, from the Kremlin's top command left local officials to decide for themselves how to act. 
According to the European security officials, when Prigozhin's Wagner troops stunned the world by entering the southern Russian city of Rostov in the early hours of June 24th, seizing control of the Russian military's main command centre there, and then moved to the city of Voronezh before heading further toward, north toward Moscow. Without any clear orders, local military and security chiefs took the decision not to try to stop the heavily armed Wagner troops, the security officials said. So what's going on here is that you've got this idea that, or, or the fact that the, the Wagner troops very easily seem to approach Russia with very little resistance. But rather than these people being in support of Wagner necessarily, one explanation could well be that the the Russian troops simply didn't have any orders, didn't know quite what to do, because right from the top, in such a hierarchical military administration, you don't do anything unless you're told to do something. That's that's the idea of the Russian armed forces, and I assume the Rosgvardi as well. You don't have these kind of NCO, this non-commissioned officer cadre of uh, soldiers and, and the wherewithal f for these NCOs to act uh, off their own backs sort of, you know, uh, somewhat independently. And that gives them an enfranchisement. So, you know, the power to to be reactive in when situations require it. They don't kind of have that, the Soviet war machine. So they only do things when they're told to do it. And if they're not told to do anything, then you get some kind of paralyzed stasis. And that seems to be what happened during the mutiny. The article continues, many on the local level would not believe the Wagner rebellion could be happening without some degree of agreement with the Kremlin, the security officials said, despite Putin's emergency televised address to the nation on the morning of the mutiny in which he vowed tough action to stop the rebels and despite a warrant against, uh, sorry, a warrant issued for Prigozhin's arrest for incitement to insurrection on the eve of his march to Moscow. Quote, the local authorities did not receive any commands from the leadership said a senior Ukrainian security official. From our point of view, this is the biggest sign of the unhealthy situation inside Russia. The authoritarian system is formed in such a way that without a very clear command from the leadership, people don't do anything. Exactly what it's just saying. When the leadership is in turmoil and disarray, it is the same situation at the local level and even worse. So that is what what people are feeling at the top gets felt at the bottom because there is no disconnect. There's no ability for people to act independently throughout that chain. So it's like, ah, at the top, you go, ah, ah or like no action at the top, no action all the way down. Um, the intelligence information helps explain what's been seen as the biggest debacle of Putin's rule, how Prigozhin's armored band, armed band of fighters demanding the ouster of Russian Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu and Armed Forces Chief of Staff Valery Gerasimov were able to proceed to within 120 miles of Moscow without facing resistance. Um, some supported Prigozhin and the idea of the leadership needs to be cleaned up, uh, that the fish is rotting from the head, one official said. One senior NATO official said some senior figures in Moscow appeared ready to rally behind Prigozhin had he succeeded in achieving his demands. Quote, there seem to have been important people in the power structures who seem to have been um, sort of waiting for this as if his attempt had been more successful, they would also have joined the plot, uh, the official said. But others in the security establishment were horrified at the mutiny attempt at the Kremlin's toothless reaction, convinced it was leading Russia toward a period of deep turmoil. Uh, quote, there was disarray. You could argue about the depth of it, but there really was a lack of agreement, said a senior member of Russian diplomatic circles. We heard all these statements. They were not always consistent. For some time, they did not know how to react. He said, Putin had vowed to crush the rebellion on the morning the rebellion began, but by the time he finally emerged in public more than 48 hours later, he had all, he said all steps had been taken on his direct order to avoid major bloodshed. And so the article continues. Uh, yeah, interesting view into the Kremlin, into like, the activities of Putin or the inactivities of Putin. Uh, he appears not to be uh, at all times this kind of strongman leader that's taking care of, of everything within uh, the confines of the Kremlin. Um, yeah, a, a paralyzed leader, unable to act, passing on that paralysis down the chain of command. Right, I'm going to leave you, I think, today with this. It's a, a little analysis in the ISW, Institute for the Study of War, American Military Think Tank. Uh, this is from uh, Natalia uh, 
Bogoyova, who is uh, a fellow non-resident and former Russia research team lead for the ISW. Um, she says, my latest with the ISW, the West risks handing the Kremlin another opportunity to prolong its war in Ukraine if it fails to resource Ukraine's sustained counteroffensive. So nothing we don't already kind of have some grasp on here, but let, let's try and uh, see what she has to say. Momentum is a key dimension of capability in this war. Maintaining the Ukrainian initiative will likely result in compounding damage to Russia's ability to sustain a war. Any breather for Russia is an opportunity for the Kremlin to reconstitute for future attacks. Ukraine, the, with Western support, has achieved substantial military results over the past 17 months. Ukraine defeated the Kremlin's initial objectives in this war, liberated about 75,000 square kilometres of territory and prevented Russia from establishing control over the Donbass. Ukraine's counteroffensive cannot be expected to be fast and easy. Russia had time to prepare. Ukraine is attempting combined arms without air superiority and with limited enablers for manoeuvre. Ukraine, unlike Russia, is optimizing its operations to preserve its own forces. Now, I was going to share with you like a five minute interview of a Russian POW who had some insights, but actually it wasn't too much of interest other than, you know, months and months of preparation on on the front line in Saporizhia and being involved in, in the building of those um, those defenses, just how much work has been put into into those massive wide-ranging defences along the Zaporizhian Donetsk Oblast in, in the south. Ukrainian forces, she continues, are nevertheless advancing and adapting. Ukraine has liberated about two-thirds of the same amount of territory in five weeks that Russia, Russian forces captured in over six months. Ukrainian forces will continue to liberate Ukraine's territory if properly supported. The West must learn a lesson from last year and invest proactively in sustaining Ukraine's uh, initiative to deny Russia the time to reconstitute. The West should focus on enabling Ukraine to do what works, not to try to enable Ukraine to do what the West thinks it would do. Ukraine's sustained initiative is also an opportunity to exploit a Kremlin weakness. The Kremlin's limited ability to rapidly pivot after consecutive setbacks is a vulnerability, one that the West must help Ukraine exploit to secure the most advantageous position possible. Now, I think this is interesting. It's sort of related to the last point about the paralysis of uh, Putin. Putin's not a military man. He's an FSB man. And he, he, getting involved in, in military tactics and strategy is probably ill-advised. There, There is a, you know, a history of politicians doing that, getting involved. And not that he's he is a politician now of sorts. I mean, he's a dictator, but an FSB man. But you know they they don't have the kind of military theory behind them and the and the experience on the battlefield to maybe be able to make those correct decisions but if you've got a kind of an inability to re react quickly and decisively like putin has at least at times shown uh, then that might be a problem if he's involved in the decision making to a large degree but even with people like Gerasimov and Shoigu, and Shoigu's not really a military man either, and he's defence minister, he's, he didn't serve himself. So, you know, all those medals are kind of made up medals of like, well done for turning up to, you know, school swimming gala, uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, maybe Grasmov is in a better position, but maybe he's just not a quick actor. And, and the analysis here is that they're not very good at pivoting really quickly and adapting in a very, very quick way. You know, you had Surovikin, it's like, right, we need to, we need to adapt and build defences and withdraw from them. You know, he seemed at least vaguely competent and then he was kind of arrested and disappeared. So, yeah, this, that is, uh, I, I kind of agree with that um, analysis from uh, Boogie over there. So, um, yeah, the, the inability to pivot quickly. So the Kremlin's limited ability to rapidly pivot after consecutive setbacks is a vulnerability, one that the West must help Ukraine exploit to secure the most advantageous possible position. Uh, Russia almost always adapts in the kinetic and information space if given time. Rapid pivots are not in the Kremlin's forte, however. Had Ukrainian counteroffensive continued in December 2022 to January 2023, Russian forces would not have been able to stabilise the lines as effectively. Now, this is going back to the, after the Kharkiv offensive particularly, but also Kherson, there was a kind of like stop to reconstitute, uh, gather our forces, bring in people to sort out everything that we've just taken over. But some people argued that Ukraine should have carried on going. Don't give up momentum. 
uh, arguably, you know, if you extend yourself too too weakly and thinly, then you're you're inviting counterattacks that can cause more problems. But actually, if the Russians were really routing and on the run, particularly in the Kharkiv area, Kharkiv area, then actually that should that that is possibly. Uh, you know, bad decision to stop there. You know, they, they they were routing, take advantage of that, harry them and harry them and just pile everyone in, get all your reserves in from goodness knows where, get them in there and take advantage of that because the Russians were aren't very good at reacting really quickly is what she's saying. So it's unclear how well the Kremlin would have been able to control the information space amid continued Ukrainian offensives. Consecutive setbacks resulted in shockwaves in the Russian nationalist space and accelerated the chain of events that led to Prigozhin's uh, rebellion uh, sustained Ukrainian operations on the battlefield that continuously, even if gradually, drive Russian forces out of Ukraine will likely have compounding effects on Putin's ability to sustain the war. So I think, so think some fairly interesting uh, analysis there on what needs to happen, as in they need a lot of support to continue the momentum, especially when they do get momentum, they need to really exploit that and it needs to be, you know, all in. Uh, because of the Russians' inability to react quickly. So, you know, if that kind of Kharkiv offensive situation happens again, will the Ukrainians be able to just sustain that momentum for just that little bit longer? Uh, one would hope so. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate all your support. Please like, subscribe and share. Uh, thank you to those uh, of my members who are consistently supporting. Thanks on to all the people on Buy Me A Coffee. I'll give out a, sh a shout out to you explicitly in tomorrow's video. Take care. Speak soon.